we are trying um, these webinars as part of our centenary series because um, the college is 100 this year, which is, you know, a huge celebration. So we thought we'd, um, we'd try some different ways to talk about our work, you know, so that we can have people, you know, for example, different places, um, you know, and also we work with lots of different people. We've got Pat and Alex with us today. Um, so, you know, Pat and Alex are both long-term cooperators who've been involved in the cooperative movement in various guises for probably decades, I would say. Um, and they both are active um, cooperative researchers and um, they are currently, um, Pat works as uh, an associate for Cooperatives UK and they are both involved in, um, is it called Collaborate.coop that you're both involved in? Consultancy co-op. Oh, consultancy co-op, yeah. Uh, cooperative in Wales. And also, in recent years, and also have produced a variety of reports about that subject, um, which have involved, um, you know, working, looking at the way that cooperatives and trade unions can work together Kind of overcome the issues around um, the gig economy and precarious workers. So without further ado, I think I should hand over to Pat and Alex and um, Pat is actually going to oh, there's someone else joining us now, here's Sarah. Um, so uh, the webinar, Co-ops Automation and Decent Work Looking to the Future is just about to kick off with Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. So I'll share the screen if it works. Okay. Everyone see that? Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, anyway, this particular um, bit of work I'm going to talk about, I'm just going to try to move these. Um, hold on. To shift the. Um, Anyway, it's quite, I need to shift the, um, the, the photos because they're right in the middle of the slides in my, on my particular oh, they? They're screen. not on my screen. They are. If you put your mouse screen. over them, if you put your mouse over them, Pat, yeah. then a little bit at the top will come up. Yeah. Go up under the black bar. Yeah, yeah. I and see. then you'll be able to drag it. Okay. But you've got to be touching the black bar at the top to drag it. Okay. Oh yeah, that's fine. Perfect. Just that's Brilliant. just perfect. Great. Okay. Good. Send the invoice for the IT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well done. Thank you very much. Okay. 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 Let me begin. Um, we did a report uh, which was la launched just about a year ago, last March, in Cardiff, and then we had an event in in, in Manchester at the college. Um, it was our third report on precarious work. The second one we did in 2017 was on uh, which was the trade union congress. Um, this particular one was looking more broadly. Uh, it's called Working Together. So if you want to get the report, you can just Google um, Cooperative College, um, Working Together, uh, you'll find it. Um, so we're going to give you some of the highlights from the report, Alex and myself in this presentation, and, um, and just show you what some of the practical ways forward we found, which builds on the work that we did in 2016 and 2017. So, so in terms of the current state of play, it's getting worse year by year. I'm, I'm not telling anyone on this uh, anything they don't already know, but it's quite interesting, the figures. Um, so about one in five workers are precariously engaged in, in um, some form of work. And there's been the traditional um, situation you can see with the first bullet, which is the casual agency workers. Now, really, since in the last decade, that figure has pretty much stayed the same. So the number of agency workers, the casualized workers working through agencies, the temporary staff, um, that really hasn't, um, hasn't changed. It stayed at about three quarters of a million. Um, and, but of course, you can see the issue of low pay, 40% uh, less than, than average workers in terms of what their earnings are. Um, and of course, they're protected by the European um, um, legislation. Zero hour contract workers, you can see there's been a huge growth in the last 12 years from 70,000 to um, approaching a million. 
Um, and that's a particularly strong phenomenon in, in the UK. Um, Self-employed workers has grown um, quite significantly. Uh, we're now at about 4.8 million self-employed people, uh, but 3.7 million, um, you know, so approaching 80% are in poverty, working in poverty. So the traditional image of the self-employed is, is not somebody who's independent and actually relative, doing very well, I mean, actually doing very badly. So it's, and, and a lot of that has to do with, of course, the new technology that since um, the introduction of the iPhone over a decade ago has enabled um, work to be outsourced uh, through uh, different types of platforms. Uh, gig economy workers are growing. Um, they are, we can talk about it. That's, a fi that's a, the latest figure we are able to get. Um, so um, it's growing year on year, but uh, it's important to say that the gig economy is still a small part of precarious work relatively. And this is a figure at the bottom of um, uh, false self-employment. We can talk about. It. Now, he, of course, uh, the, um, the interesting thing about the corporations engaging um, through crowdsourcing labor uh, through self-employed people is that, of course, the taxi trade with Uber and Lyft has had the biggest amount of publicity in the media uh, globally. Uh, but you can see from here um, that it's actually spreading to, you know, more and more sectors, you know, from, of course, delivery is very well known, but house repairs, odd jobs with TaskRabbit, admin work with ClickWorker, but also supply teachers and super carers. Um, super carers is working in, in the social care field. Um, and um, for somewhat higher paid workers, uh, Upwork um, is quite is a huge corporation. The um, the next slide. Um, these are some of the ways forward that we found where uh, it's potentially a possible, um, increasingly so, for trade unions and cooperatives to work hand in glove, work in partnership, work closely together. So we'll be talking in more detail of, of, of some on that list, uh, these, this list, the freelance co-ops and, and the first, um, if you like, five, we'll, we'll talk about quite a bit. The ones below that, number six, number 10, universal basic income, we make the case in, in, in the report for um, universal basic income, which you know, it's, it's, it's a debatable thing, but in terms of, um, it's interesting that the TUC, the Trade Union Congress has supported universal basic in, income as have increasingly more trade unions. Um, I'll come back to uh, number eight and number nine later. So let's move on. Um, so in terms of what are the needs of people who are, um, are, are particularly freelance workers, um, there are many needs, some of which actually are being provided by some trade unions, as we'll show. Others are being provided by co-ops. So for us, it was a question of, well, can we bring them both together? Because actually there's a complementarity between what trade unions do and what, um, what, what, what co-ops do. But there's a very long list of needs, as you can see. Um, and um, we'll, we'll give you examples of how uh, co-ops and trade unions are doing this either on their own or together. The recent report, uh, um, there's been a recent report um, by Matthew Taylor for the British government, um, which is generally, I think, a problematic report because it sits on the fence. Um, but the worker tech idea, I think, is an interesting idea, which relates to this issue of platform co-ops or platform union co-ops, potentially, which we'll, uh, we'll talk about. Um, I think I'll hand over here to Alex to pick up this example from France. But you need to unshare. First. Unshare, okay. It only allows one share at once, apparently. Okay. <laughs> oh, shall I, what if I just do, click it for you? you? Can you talk to this one and then I can just move it on? You should have something at the, uh, at the top, right at the very top of your screen. Yeah, yeah but now all the, all the photos, uh, everyone's photos are at the top. Right. Um, let's see. Okay, well, if you click for me. I'll I'll let on. Let no, no, it's okay. I'll do it. Okay. There you go.
Okay, everyone, you should be able to see. Yep. Slide again, but coming from a slightly different place. <laughs> right. So the, the very first of the uh, of the co-op activity a Dumpois, CAEs was started back in 1995. Um, they started off really as as schemes with government support, regional government, local government support, to get uh, people off benefits and in self employment. So they started off with a system whereby people could uh, um, open what is effectively an escrow account. That is an account where um, they can earn money, but they can't actually spend any of it. It's locked away from them so that they can continue to receive benefits and start their businesses inside the CAE's legal structure. So they actually become a cost center within the CAE. Uh, there are 74 CAE's now across France employing, as you can see, over 7,000 people. Um, annual turnover at the minute of 90 million uh, euros. So quite, it's quite a, a, a large scale operation that's grown and that's partly because it's got this element of government support because it's working trying to get people off benefits. Um, this is the, uh, the biggest of those individuals and actually it is a result of a combination of 10 of the smaller ones coming together. Established in 2004, so a little bit younger than the entire movement, got 850 members and as you can see, um, well over 8 million in euros turnover between them. Then we also looked at SMART. Now SMART works in a very similar system. It was done a few years later in 1998 by a couple of formulators. But it came from a, a different basis. It came, first of all, completely independent of government. It's, uh, it's, it's had very small amounts of government and European money, but its fundamental principle is, is the basic co-op principle of people putting their own money, pooling their own money, pooling their own efforts, and setting this up. So they're not intending to work um, with people coming off benefits, although obviously, um, as they started work with artists, a lot of artists spend quite a long time uh, resting, as they like to call it, which is um, their, their speak for unemployed between jobs. So they are people coming off benefits, but that's not the reason for it, and it hasn't got government support for doing that. It set itself up originally as a social enterprise, but under the influence of uh, Sandrino Grafica, uh, who comes from, uh, from, from France, despite the slightly Italian name. Um, and he's a very much a, a, a dyed in the wool cooperator. So he's um, encouraged it to transfer into a cooperative form. They've got franchises across eight European countries and they're just in the process now of trying to set up a franchise and I believe it's just about to start in Quebec in Canada. So it works by producing the system to give the precarious workers to manage their own career paths as part of the, uh, the, the co-op. So the co-op doesn't really do anything for them in terms of finding work. They have to find their own work. But the co-op provides then all the technical basis. So the co-op will provide them with um, a pro forma for contracts, it will handle all of the invoices and it will collect the money on their behalf. Again, like the CAEs, they act as part of this larger co-op. It has also in recent years guaranteed the members payments from its own mutual reserves. One of the reasons it can do that, of course, is that it's quite big. Um, it's, it's regarded by the Belgian government as a large employer because it's got so many people working through it, as we'll see in a couple of slides time. So it's able to do that and it's able to exert some muscle when it needs to collect money on their behalf. It's also opened co-working spaces. It's got six of them. This is La Vallée, which was once a laundry. The laundry business obviously has changed over decades. It's the largest and newest. It's been completely refurbed and it's 60,000 square feet or 6,000 square meters, if you want to do it in metric approximately, of space that is rented out. And this is the common area in the middle which is also used as an exhibition space. So as you can see here, membership's grown steadily from around about 4,000 back in 2003 up to 85,000. Last available figures the end of 2017. The 2018 figures haven't come out round yet. And there's a further 20,000 members in the franchises across Europe. A slightly similar operation and, and one that has worked together, IndyCube have a, an ongoing um, communication and exchange of information with SMART in Belgium. IndyCube is started as a co-working space and has now 
joined up with Community Trade Union and between the two of them they're starting to establish some of the services that they uh, uh, make available to the CAEs in France and with Smart in Belgium and I'm afraid just crawling around this morning I couldn't find the details but there's a similar organization also operating in Italy now. So it provides all those back offices in exactly the same way but what it doesn't do and it, it, this is what both the French and the Belgians do is they don't provide full employment status. This one works for people who are in self-employed status and therefore don't have access to benefits. There are a number of reasons for this, uh, one of which I think has to be a simple acceptance of the fact that in Belgium they have a social security system that we would all love to have and uh, in Britain we have a social security system that everyone thinks is appallingly poor value for money and don't really want to join. So people in Britain are, are not content in, in being self-employed because they don't have any benefits but at least they feel they're not being ripped off by the amount of money the government takes from them in, the, in national insurance and then doesn't provide them with any benefits. Um, there are some much earlier examples here that we've got in the UK of co-ops that work in a slightly different way um, on behalf of the self-employed. Actors have always been self-employed in, in the UK. Um, and as you can see, if you look down the bottom of the screen, or an actors management um, in, in Cardiff, actually in, in Wales, is one that I've worked with since it actually started in 1977. It's the longest running actors agency in Wales of any type, um, cooperative or non-cooperative. It started on the basis, as many of these actors co-ops did, on the basis that actors are spending an awful lot of their time, probably something like 40 weeks a year unemployed, again resting as they like to call it. Um, so they use their spare time uh, to go and run their own agencies rather than paying uh, Mr. 10% to do it for them. So there are now 30 actors co-ops across the UK. They've from the, almost from the very beginning had the support of Actors' Equity, the trade union, and in 2002 um, they found there were so many that Equity worked with them to produce the Cooperative Personal Management Association, which brings them all together. Uh, taxis are another interesting business for the self-employed. Um, taxi business has been around since before the invention of the motor car and taxi drivers have always effectively been self-employed. Um, of course they actually predate the legislation that decided there was a difference between employment and self-employment. If you go back far enough everyone just worked uh, and took money and uh, if the government knew enough about you it could then try and get some tax off you at the end of the year. So they've always been um, self-employed and there are, there are some hotspots. We've had a number of towns where taxi co-ops have come and gone, but in Edinburgh, the capital of, uh, of Scotland, um, city cabs and central taxis, city cabs as you can see established in 1925, completely dominate the trade. It's something like 80% of the trade in Edinburgh. Basically, if you step into a cab, that's not got an Uber sign on the side of it, in Edinburgh, you're almost certainly getting into a unionized uh, cooperative uh, cab company. Similarly, Green Taxi Co-op in Denver, much, much more recent, um, founded in response to the Uberization of the taxi market in Denver, very, very quickly grew to 800 drivers from 37 different nationalities. So you can imagine what the meetings are like in terms of translation requirements. Uh, they got 37% of the market in a very, very short space of time. One of the reasons that they've done so well is again the support from the trade union, uh, not especially financial support, but the trade union gave them office, telephone and, uh, and networking links, which enabled them to get up and growing very quickly. So on that point, I'll hand over to Pat again. Pat, you need to unmute. Thank you. Um. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, this is a different model, uh, which we researched for Co-ops UK uh, in 2014 with a report on um, how to tackle the problems of social care um, and others, other services in the social economy through cooperative models. Um, what's interesting, we found, uh, obviously, Bologna is uh, famous um, 
because of the being in the heart of Emilia Romana and um, that region, because of an approach which is a partnership approach with local government um, from the 1970s and 80s, developed um, through developing ecosystems of support for cooperatives. Uh, new employment um, during a period of high, high uh, unemployment um, across Europe, you know, the, uh, the, the late 70s, early 80s was a period of high unemployment and, and high inflation, developed an approach to developing new jobs through, um, through, through cooperative ownership, particularly worker cooperative ownership, but also um, social cooperatives, which I'll talk about in a moment. So today it has the highest density, I think, of cooperatives in Europe. Um, and if you look at the figure there in terms of um, reportedly 40% of GDP is accounted for by the cooperatives in, in Emilia Romana, that province, that region, um, that's really similar to the number of cooperatives in the UK in one, in one region of Italy. So in the UK, um, the cooperative sector accounts for 2% of gross domestic product, whereas in Italy, it accounts for 10% of the gross domestic product and the success of, of Emilia Romana in, in creating this link with local authorities, uh, local government has been um, very successful in, 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 in developing a public cooperative partnership. Um, also, uh, there's highly integrated networks amongst cooperatives uh, across sectors, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, so some of the innovations that were developed in Italy, um, like for example, the cooperative consortia, unites co-ops in different trades, uh, provides uh, the sort of things that we're talking about in terms of what cooperatives can provide for freelancers, uh, legal advice, training, um, back office services that we saw, as we saw with SMART, um, help with um, tendering if their contracts to be tendered for, um, to do it together in a in, through the consortium, negotiating power through the federated structure. Um, so while secondary co-ops like this are pretty common across the international co-op movement, but the way that this has been done, particularly for uh, worker co-ops and social cooperatives in Italy, um, has been very, very important in, 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 in furthering growth uh, of the cooperative sector, particularly in, in particular regions of Italy where um, they've been able to achieve this. And another innovation, which I think goes back in Italy probably to the 1950s, was the way of actually reducing the cost of capital, working capital and development capital for co-ops by developing an insurance um, scheme where the co-ops invest shares into an insurance fund, effectively a mutual guarantee society, which provides um, pulled, pulled insurance to cooperative banks um, to provide capital at a lower cost and also avoid the circumstance, which is common in the UK, where uh, businesses have to provide, if they own property, provide their own house, if they own a house or a flat, uh, to the bank as security. So this is a way of overcoming that particular problem as well. Um, and also, as you can see under four, um, the Macora law in 1985 uh, provided a public financing facility and a way of rolling up unemployment benefit for a couple of years so that workers could actually buy out their firms in circumstances where, um, you know, they would otherwise lose their jobs or circumstances where the, the um, the, um, the entrepreneur, the family wants to retire and rather than selling it to uh, a, another company, um, the worker buyouts facilitated by this particular law. And as a consequence of um, these innovative financing solutions and the, the way that the cooperative consortia works um, to implement principle six, cooperation amongst cooperatives uh, through the consortia and the financing mechanisms that link to cooperative banks, um, the sector has been able to grow quite significantly since 1970s. So for example, in the UK, we had some of these uh, mechanisms in place um, until about 1990, when there were in fact 3000 worker co-ops in the UK. And I think the figures in Italy were probably comparable to that uh, in some ways. Maybe Italy was probably more, but 
uh, now we have this big gap with only about 500 worker co-ops. I mean, that's also a problem because in Anglo-Saxon uh, countries like Canada, the USA, UK, Australia, New Zealand, um, the policy has favored employee ownership and social enterprise, not cooperative ownership, not worker ownership. So public policy has moved away in, in, since 1990 from worker ownership, uh, where workers own and control um, the means of production. So, um, you know, this is an issue for government, really. Um, so, also, the, uh, now to say something more specifically about social cause, because as I, we said earlier, platforms are moving into social care um, with gig economy workers. It's still very early days. And what you have in social care for services for older people or community health um, services is a very low paid workforce um, and the commissioning is with the local authority, local government, which has been starved of resources since 2009 with cuts every year. So precarious work, low pay, zero hour contracts for UK workers is in, in the care sector and community health sectors is just the way it is these days. Um, so we looked in 2014 at how social cooperatives could be introduced here using some of the uh, lessons from Italy. So some of the benefits they have uh, negotiated as part of um, the 1991 law for social cooperatives, which helped them expand. By 1991, there were about a thousand social co-ops. Now um, there's 12 or 13,000. There are many of them. Um, the type B social co-op is, is a type that actually helps people who are disadvantaged, like for example, people who are homeless or people who are recovering from addiction or whether it's alcohol or drugs or people coming out of prison to get a job um, or disabled people to get jobs um, through type B social co-ops, which have the added benefit of being exempt from national insurance contributions. Those are paid for by the state. Um, also social co-ops have a lower value added tax rate as you can see compared to the, the commercial standard rate of 21%. I don't know why, whether uh, Samuel was saying that that figure has changed, but that was the figure we had in 2014 for the lower VAT rate. It might have, might have actually come closer since then. Uh, there's tax relief um, that social co-ops can get for donors like other nonprofits can get. And also, uh, number seven, you, you'll see that um, it's possible for social co-ops to get, uh, for new social co-ops to get equity loans from cooperative banks, uh, and also for adding additional worker for, to get additional equity loans with the equity payment that the worker brings into the business being a loan, but then is repaid uh, as payroll deduction. The other interesting thing is the National Trade Union Agreement, which was negotiated, I think, in 1992 for social cooperatives because the trade unions in Italy were concerned that this was going to under, um, uh, you know, lead to cheap work for public sector jobs. That was negotiated, I think, in 1992, thereabouts anyway. Um, and today, according to figures that we had from SACOP, about half of social cooperatives or um, uh, have collective bargaining agreements. So they work with trade unions to secure those. As you can see, um, the number of jobs, um, the service users and the turnover, these are 1994, uh, 2014, 2015 figures. So they're, they're higher now, now to some degree, no doubt. Um, what we found in our research was that, that we found very interesting the work in the US, which is still early days to bring union and co-ops together organically so that when a new co-op is is begun it's begun in a unionized way um, or when um, let's say with worker buyouts um, this could this could come into play or also with um, freelance workers you could approach it this way so it was a response to the 2008 crash and a response to the decline of trade unions so in the in the united kingdom 23% of the labor force is in trade unions. Heavily that's still in the public sector, but in the United States it's down to 11% uh, are in trade unions. So it's a far worse level of decline in the US compared to the UK. 
So it was a response to, um, to, 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 to these circumstances. Um, here are some examples. So it started with, with a negotiated uh, conversation between the Mondragon cooperatives in, in, in the Basque country of Spain and in Spain generally with the United Steelworkers, which operates in, in, in Canada, the United States. It was a specific discussion about how they could come together um, to develop this model. And after a number of years, they came up with a model. It's now beginning to work across 10 cities. You've got some of the bigger cities there indicated. Um, and one worker, one vote, you can go onto that website, are supporting the process. There's information by Michael Peck about how things are going. Now, this gives you an example of how it works. So on the left, you've got, for example, some of the unions, there are, I think now 10 or 11 unions across the United States that are supporting this model through their local branch, typically through a local branch in one of, in, in one of the 10 cities. But the diagram on the right shows you that, of course, it's worker ownership as it is in a worker co-op, um, but the union committee in the Mondragon model the Mondragon model um, has the social committee. So the union committee there um, replaces the social committee. That's how it's organically built into the model. Very clever, I think. Um, we actually found a, 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 a co-op, a worker co-op in this country called SUMA, which a number of people in the UK will know, works in the whole food sector and, and distribution logistics. Um, uh, and they've got about 200 worker owners, but they've had an arrangement like this since 1986 with the Baker's Union. It works incredibly well. Um, so we know it can work because of a homegrown example here. So we're particularly interested in this, this particular model, but it does mean that the, uh, the, the union movement and the co-op movement have to uh, come together and make it happen. Um, in periods of time, like the 1890s, the 1920s, the 1970s, and the early 1980s, union co-ops or unions and co-ops did work hand in glove together. So when, when times are hard, you know, when the business cycle goes south, um, you get a solidarity thing happening, but then it seems to fade away, or that's been the experience of the UK. Um, and, and, and the unions and the co-ops go their separate ways. So now is a time where the conversation is reanimating, activating, and so we need to find ways forward. The union co-op model, we think, um, makes this possible organically and dynamically. So the last slide here is that out of the consequence of our last report, working together, we began figuring out, well, how could we at the Cooperative College and Co-ops UK um, move things forward. So we felt Unions Co-ops UK would be the way forward to bring a dialogue together as they've done in the United States, bring that dialogue together here. And we did a concept paper, which you can download. And we circulated that a couple of months ago. And already we've attracted eight trade unions, including um, the General Federation of Trade Unions, which has 28 trade union members and some big ones like the GMB and the Unite to join um, in the steering group for Unions Co-ops UK. We hope to have a conference, our first conference, sometime in 2019, probably it looks like the autumn. But anyway, so we're beginning to build a partnership with this particular approach. So over to you for questions. Okay, well, um, these slides will be sent around to everyone who signed up for the webinar. So. Um, you know, all of the, because I know that um, Pat and Alex have included some additional information after, um, after these slides as well. So there, there's, there's even more kind of meat on the bone, if you like. So um, if you unshare your screen, Pat, then we'll be able to see everybody. Um, that's brilliant. So just like to say thank you to everyone for joining us and welcome to people who joined us after, after we got started. Um, I thought that was um, a really, really interesting topic that I know I know something about and have been involved in some of um, Pat and Alex's work. And I was just thinking, you know, we've just had the news this week about um, Hermes now kind of changing the 
the uh, you know the employment status of some of its um, zero hours drivers. Um, you know, so I think this is this is like a current and rolling debate that that keeps going on and on. And um, so I just think it would be really interesting to hear um, anyone's questions. So if you hold your hand up or um, in some way indicate whether or not you'd like to ask a question, everyone's on mute at the moment, so I can unmute people. Um, is there anybody who'd like to ask a question at this point? I can't seem to unmute that. I do have a question. How many people are involved in the broadcast at the moment? The people you can see on the screen. Okay, okay, that, that just changed things slightly. Uh, I was expecting a lot more people and that I'd be contributing and disrupting their, their conversation. Uh, I think it's a very oh. interesting presentation. And um, particularly because one of the things that the, the corporate, corporate movement has to answer is its relationship with other very powerful institutions and very powerful uh, bodies. So from that point of view, it's, it's interesting to tease those, those, those elements out. I think, the, I think the, G, the GMB have joined um, the Union Co-ops UK steering group and I think the work that they did um, first to win the industrial tribunal in the summer of last year against Hermes for uh, bogus self-employment was a, a big step forward. Their legal team has been very good also in the work that they've done uh, against Uber for um, similar kind of uh, relationship to its workforce. Uh, but then to negotiate this contract, um, the collective ag bargaining agreement, which is a, a you know a big step forward for guaranteed hours and also um, a, a guaranteed 24, 24 days holiday um, and worker rights effectively um, a step forward um, is 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 helpful. I mean, it, it is really helpful, um, you know, because it's 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 the first strong bit of good news we've had for some time so um and hopefully more trade unions will move into this into this area yes i mean i think it's a question of how they do it um and then also i think it's a for the unions and the co-ops they need to learn how to dance together in in, yeah. in, a, in a way that's not so clumsy yeah, yeah. We, we need to refresh our thinking um yeah. a, a lot of the work i've done for the last few years has been through agencies and although on, on paper it looks very uh, prestigious work as a consultant, there are still, there's still those relationships uh, can, can intrude up, up, upon, the, upon the feeling of engagement with, with the organisations that you're working with. So it's good to see people opening up that field and having those discussions. Yeah, on the, on the agency side of things, that's, uh, SMART is very interesting. I think in, in, I don't know if you heard Alex's presentation about SMART, but you know, with, they are effectively like an umbrella co-op uh, for, for freelancers. And they, you know, they handle their invoices. Um, they, they help them, they collect debts. You know, they, they provide access to sh shared equipment, increasingly workspace. So, you know, the, they're, they're, they're uh, they're, they have a dialogue with the Belgian trade unions. I don't think it's actually advanced so far very, very much, but they're particularly interested in how um, perhaps a union co-op model might you know, enhance what they offer um, considerably. Um, they also have uh, Uber drivers who are, are members of SMART because of course they help with the cash flow. So. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, Deliveroo, Deliveroo drivers as well, and they had a special deal at one point with Deliveroo that uh, they got a, a different payment method for the people who invoice through Smart. But Deliveroo have pulled out of that recently, and, and that's always a difficulty with huge corporations. There's a, there's a battle for size, you know, with with eighty thousand members and uh, something approaching a billion euros turnover. They are quite a large organisation, and they, they've got muscle and they get taken seriously. And even then, the multinationals still regard them as, as small fry and, uh, and are prepared to uh, upset perfectly good, well, well, you know, relationships that were working very well. Yes. They are, they are also a very interesting model, I think, because they turn self-employed people into effectively employees. 
whilst maintaining all of their independence. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, combination. And it means in effect, because they turn them into employees, that they need to build this rather complex relationship that the union co-ops have got with a trade union, because otherwise they do do an awful lot of what a trade union would otherwise do. They negotiate with government, um, they influence uh, policy, they, they provide some of the stuff that trade unions provide, such as insurance policies, uh, you know, access to credit, etc. So um, the trade unions are in danger of, of being marginalised by them. They're not very careful. By, by the, the co-ops? By, by the smart style co-ops. Yeah, yeah for, so, like for example, we, we made a presentation like this, I made a presentation like this in Paris 18 months ago at the, because the European Trade Union Confederation um, was having a conference uh, specifically on this topic. And the Belgian trade union said to me, well, yeah, but the problem with them is that they're actually taking away our members. And they were talking specifically about members who are musicians or in musicians unions in Belgium or in, for example, actors who join SMART and then they don't join the trade union. So that's an issue. But, you know, doesn't, doesn't that actually suggest maybe there should be a marriage? Absolutely. If, if you yeah. look at the rather than actually looking, I mean, looking at it as an opportunity rather than a threat. I mean, yeah. if you look at the when I said that, they said, you know, they, 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 they thought, oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah. So. But the IndyCube community model, they get a single payment that means that you join the union and you join IndyCube. So that, you know, there is a, a true marriage there. It's a very difficult marriage. It has, uh, because they don't really fully understand each other. And that is one of the difficulties with, with trade unions. They think they've got it all sorted in terms of how employment works. And this is completely new for them. And they've got to get up a learning curve to understand it. But it's a huge space for them. And it's easier for them to get into that space if they start at the beginning. So then, you know, a space within, you know, like, like Pat's little circle there for the union co-ops, there's a space within that circle for the unions to get into. And the co-op then doesn't need to develop some of the things that trade unions do. But if they don't get in the beginning, in the end, the co-op does it itself. It's very, it's a very difficult thing to achieve, though. That that mm. that openness to to completely reshaping the territory. I know. It, it's I, I, I've been working with the Labour Party up in, in Stafford, and uh, one of the things that keeps coming up is how do we work with people who've got a different narrative, because that shapes very very powerfully how they see events and how they they see other people whether they've got an oppositional narrative or a, or a collaborative narrative you yeah, that's a that's a very good point um and it is because it mean, it means the trade unions have got to kind of go into unfamiliar territory because of course if their familiar territory is big employers whether in the public sector and and also in the private sectors to, to a lesser and lesser extent but but if actually you know our first report in 2016 showed that Two thirds of new jobs since 2010 have been created by self-employed people. Well, if, 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 the, if the labor force of the future are having to create their own jobs, then, you know, how do they relate to the collective bargaining model of industrial, uh, industrial trade unions and general trade unions that, you know, haven't organized in that sector probably since the 1920s? Yeah. You know, so it, it, is, it, is a, it is community organizing which is required, and mutual aid models, uh, which were very strong before the First World War, but you know, it's just a different territory. Uh, and it, it requires a different set of skills. It was very um, specifically that, that, that need that has attracted me to, to the cooperative movement, because I, I, I see institutions that are bound by their history, and the Labour Party was born in opposition. So it, it finds it very difficult, I think, to shift out of, out of a, an oppositional um, frame of mind and I, I see this portrayed in so many ways and it, uh, we turn inwards sometimes it's like a, a feeding frenzy when opposition comes up we see we so easily shift into a, a mindset that is uh, destructive and we, we need to, to arm ourselves against it see, in, in the language works against us we, we need to find a new language yeah, I mean sometimes it's called the solidarity economy which, which is, we, we're not using that so much here, but yeah. in Greece, for example, with 50% youth unemployment and 25% you know, adult unemployment, 
they've really been building the solidarity economy because really they've backs against the wall. Spain as well with a similar situation, France, Italy. So solidarity economy means something, but here it, it's still not, it's not common language yet. It should be, but. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting because I've been having some success with the local CLP. I've had people start to, to change the way they, they, they engage with, with the discussion. They, they've started, it, it, it's, it's not complete because there's some very divisive um, issues um, that, that keep uh, subverting the, the, the discussions. But I'm, start, I'm starting to see seeds starting to give, give fruit, starting to bear fruit. So I, I, I'm very interested in, in how we go beneath the events, beneath the, the, the facts and start to reconnect with, with solidarity, with, with dignity, with, um, with, with the opportunity to, to demonstrate very, very tangibly that we're working together. One, one interesting bit of hope, which has been that, uh, which I think has made a difference. The Cooperative Party, they did, a, they did a report, I did this report on social cooperatives in 1914 for, the, for Co ops UK. And we, we've got interest in Wales here in Wales where Alex and I work, but also in England. And, but the, when the Cooperative Party did a report, which was about 18 months after the report I did, then there was more interest within the Labour Party in um, the social cooperative idea. And of course, recently with the, um, the commitment of the Labour Party to double the size of the cooperative sector uh, in, in a handful of years, the Cooperative Party has commissioned the report on un unleashing co-ops, which came out last summer. So you're seeing um, a shift in, in public policy orientation, which is good. Yes. And so therefore, when we did our report on precarious work for the TUC in 2017, we didn't really get trade unions beating a path to our door, which we found a bit sad, really. But people weren't hostile, but we didn't really get that. Apart from community union, who liked the smart thing. And as Alex said, they began developing this work with Indicute, the co-op in Wales for workspace. But when we then put out our, our Union Co-ops UK concept paper in, in late September last year, we got a hugely positive response from big unions like Unite and GMB, but also the GFTU. And you know, now we've got eight or nine trade unions on the steering group. So things have changed. So yes. that, 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 that's really like good. People, people need to see something happening. Like, um, I think sometimes when you're, when you're kind of talking about these ideas and, it's, and it can seem quite theoretical to people, I think that when they actually see something working in action, then, then it's like the penny drops and then it's like, oh yeah, this is something we could be involved in. And I think that helps, doesn't it? So, so these things, they always gather traction and grow in that way, I think, or, or a bit more organically. I'm just aware of the fact that we've only got a little bit of time left. So I wanted to ask if anyone else had a question um, for uh, our um, webinar leaders today before we, uh, before we close the webinar. So does anyone else have, a, have any questions? AJ and Grant are both muted at the minute, aren't they? Well, I can't seem to unmute Grant. So. No, I, yeah, I've unmuted myself because I, I just was making a bit of noise where I was, so I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> but no, I found it really super interesting. There was some of those things I didn't even know were happening. I mean, I know a lot about um, the history of co-ops in, in Italy and Mondragon, and I know all of that, but I... I've never really thought about this issue about unions and co-ops and um, yeah, just quite a lot. So it really opened my mind to a lot more things. So thanks a lot. That was really, really interesting. I think what, what, my, what I find is that this might be, um, it'd be interesting to get Samuel's response to this in, in Milan, but the union co-op model, because it's kind of joined at the hip, the unions and the co-ops, um, so it's organically, uh, structurally connected. Me, this is this this is the way forward. It's you know it's not it's not flying off the shelf in the USA yet, but it is beginning to kind of make some headway. And so we feel that th this kind of structural connection in the way that the social committee is replaced by a union actually provides a dynamic way of making this actually get going. What do you think, Samuel? Yes, I think this point is a key point um, because those kind of new unions, small local unions and cooperatives too, are kind of self-organized 
uh, entity. And, and so the form is something, I don't know, so similar as to holacracy, sociocracy, uh, some new form of democracy. And uh, this is the key point because yeah. it's something structural. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's an another interesting point because how you actually deepen democracy and, and give voice and votes and you know make it real because trade unions really the bigger the trade unions are often the more bureaucratic and and hierarchical they are so how you democratize trade unions uh in this new way and also get cooperatives to actually practice real democracy rather than actually just having a passive membership is yeah. is, is, a, is, a, is a cultural challenge it's massively yeah. important yeah and some of the trade unions have made internal changes that have been fundamental to, to their way they work and I don't think they've always realized that. So for instance that uh, now you get uh, either salary called off or mostly direct debit payments from the members, they don't have the same point of contact with the shop stewards that they used to have. The shop stewards used to collect virtually all of the money in cash and, and, and bank it. So they had a constant relationship with their members and that made the shop stewards movement very powerful. And of course, the shop steward movement hardly exists in, in most trade unions now. And the relationships are all you know, email and telephone calls back to head office or regional office. So they, their internal structures change and they haven't adjusted for that. They haven't created new means of, of devolving power down into their, of, of developing subsidiarity and developing the, the power down towards their members. So their members tend to be consumers rather than fully engaged. Mm. Yeah, because I mean, I think that's key. I mean, we've seen it, haven't we? You know, like people are very disengaged from from politics, from their community, from from everything. And and you know, that's one of the the kind of big strengths of of the cooperative movement, isn't it? Is that there is that potential. And I, I think a lot of cooperatives don't fully engage with their membership, and probably a lot of them don't actually want their members to be too engaged because, let's face it, it gets messier, doesn't it? The more we let other people have an opinion and a say in what we're trying to do. But you know, I do think that. From what I see, I, I see this as a sort of potential emergence of, of getting people more civically engaged in, in their, their lives, you know, because I think that we, we, I think Brexit has also brought this to the fore for us in the UK. It's really shown how a complacent electorate has sort of allowed this kind of, you know, for want of a better, it's, it's, a, it's just, what is it? I mean, it's a complete, so I do think that, that um, that we, we, you know, that that, that that is one good thing about the, the these changes. I think we've sort of lost Pat there, haven't we? We have. I don't yeah. know why. <laughs> he, he does live in the country in the, in Mid Wales, so sometimes oh, his yeah. uh, his internet connection is not very good. So down. Well, I think you know we we you know it's about the, the sort of time when we would be winding up the uh, yeah. the webinar anyway. So, um, does anyone else have a last point that they want to raise before we before we? Um, I yeah. Just one final point, and it's to some extent it's what you and Pat were saying that we need to reconnect. We need to prove that those connections exist in a very mm -hmm. tangible and meaningful way. Otherwise, the the, the 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 sort of convulsions that we're seeing politically are going are going to throw us off off track. I'm I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic because what I see is is conversations on the ground that are starting to. Um, to shape and influence people's thinking. Uh, Preston, for example, yeah. the, the, the Preston um, shifts are just insp inspirational, inspirational. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to um, say and of actually, course they've got international connections as well in Preston. Yeah, do you, does everybody know about the upcoming, I mean, obviously I, I think Samuel, this is obviously probably less interest to you because you're in Italy, but we, we've got an event on the 22nd of um, February that is um, in partnership with Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, and we have people coming from Bologna, from Preston, from Rochdale, and from Cincinnati to talk about uh, placemaking and everything that's involved in that. So it's not, you know, it's about having that kind of whole package of, of, of sort of interlinked cooperative organizations working together regionally. Um, and so we, we have a, we have a, um, like a, a sort of mini conference on the 22nd of February. You'll be able to find more details on our website um, and probably on MMU's website as well if you're interested. It's 
Um, it may be of interest to people if they're, if they're in the Manchester area or can make it on that day. Okay, thank is, you. It, is it possible that some of that could be either live streamed on the web or could be um, recorded and then put up on YouTube? Yeah, I, I definitely think that it, at the very least, you know, there'll be, um, hopefully some of it will be live streamed and hope, or, or recorded. And I would say that, you know, at the very least, we will have people scribing and um, a report will be produced about what happened on the day. There's a whole TED Talk phenomena only comes from a, a simple webcam and a yeah. period recording in a website. Yeah. And, and obviously a lot of PR behind it and, and choosing controversial people. But it is, the technology behind it is ever so simple and, and we're not doing yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We need to do it more. This is why we feel like we're slightly groundbreaking using, using Zoom. Technology. You are. Within this movement, this is very groundbreaking. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really good. I mean, you know, this, this whole webinar series is, is kind of designed just to, you know, it's these new ways of engaging with people. And particularly yes. when, when people are working from home or they're, they're in different locations, you know, it, it, you know it's a means to, to get people together to discuss these things. And, you know, when we did a, we ran a course like this and we had somebody who was actually going to be working with members from FC United. Yeah. We've been kind of looking for a way in which to kind of do certain types of work with them and then she, we she came onto our course using using zoom and she suddenly it was like ah this i'm just gonna i'm gonna use this because <laughs> you can put people into breakout spaces and you can you know you can you can use it really quite creatively oh. i think it's about as well as the kind of new ways of working together it's about you know new spaces and these online spaces can potentially be really really useful to, to re-engage people in in these kind of spaces as well yeah. anyway i think i'm going to round it up we've lost pat so uh, i think we'll need to um we'll need to send a quick email to pat to say thank you very much but um, thank you. to say thank you to pat and alex this has been like really really interesting on behalf of the college and you know helping us to celebrate our 100 years and thank you ever so much for everyone who's taken part it's been really nice to um engage with some new people that i've not met before because uh you know sometimes in the um in the cooperative world you see the same faces because mm -hmm. everyone's committed so you know it's always really great when we can we can get new people um to to engage with us and come along to any um, of our events and webinars great. so so thank you very much and hopefully see you again at another webinar that we